the sound you never want to hear. It is the sound of a warning siren going off at a nuclear power plant. But whether you can hear that sound or not, we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly podcast keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from one mile away. So I know what happens when the experts get it wrong. Exciting news today that a documentary about Fukushima, shot on the ground in the first six months after that nuclear disaster began, will be launching in special presentations around the country this March 11. Listen to Nuclear Hot Seat's interview with producer-director Christopher Nolan, and then learn how you can not only view, but book a screening of this important, groundbreaking film. Now for the week's interview. Have you ever been to a big Hollywood premiere? Well, we all have our chance to get out on the red carpet and support one of our own. Christopher Nolan's new film, 311 Surviving Japan, is a harrowing yet quirky look at the first months after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began. From shock at the devastation to terror at the uncontrolled meltdown of three nuclear reactors to the daily burdens borne by the people whose lives were ripped apart by the ongoing disasters to a 50,000-person mass rally against nuclear in Tokyo only six months later. Director-producer Christopher Noland was part of the relief operation and carried his little video camera with him at all times. Hear how he was led to create a film in this nuclear hot seat interview from July of 2012. Afterwards, I'll let you know where you, yes you, can attend a red carpet premiere of the film on March 11, 2013. Christopher Nolan is a filmmaker and the director-producer of 311 Surviving Japan, a full-length documentary on the nuclear aftermath of the Tohoku earthquake and the beginnings of the Japanese people's resistance to their country's nuclear policy. Chris, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. You were living in Japan when the earthquake happened. What was that like and what was your response after that? Initially, after the earthquake happened, my response was to pretty much stay in the apartment and stay safe. The next day, of course, when the nuclear power plant exploded and everything, I actually left. My parents bought me a plane ticket to come back to America. And when I got back, my mom said to me, you're in my kitchen physically, but mentally you're not really here. And I knew at that point I was still in the disaster. And I went back because I felt that I should go help the people. How long after you had come back to the States did you actually go back to Japan? I was just back for one week. Very brave of you. So you said you went back to help people. What sort of help were you providing? At first I was just providing um, relief supplies, and then I went actually up to the affected area. You went up to the Fukushima area? Uh, I didn't go to the Fukushima area first. I went up to the Iwate prefecture to a town called Ofunado, did a lot of debris cleaning, started to hear a lot of problems with the relief operations going on from the government, and that kind of led me on a path to investigate what was going on. What sort of problems were you hearing about? Food shortages and just systematic problems with getting food around logistically and people were starving was the main thing. Nobody was getting any information about the nuclear power situation at all, um, especially up north. They considered it just to be a problem down south. They didn't think it affected them at all. So there was no information about radiation plume or the ongoing series of explosions and problems that were showing up at Fukushima? No. On television, they told us that there was an accident, and then they reverted to how the power plant worked before that. But they did not tell us how it would affect us health-wise at all. How suspicious were the Japanese people you were in contact with about this kind of information coming from the government? At first, they didn't seem very concerned about it. But as time went on, people got a lot more concerned. How did this turn into a film? After I spent time up north, I, of course, wanted to know, you know, living there, what was going on with the radiation, how the extent and everything. The mayor of Minami Selma went onto YouTube, 
the government had told everyone to stay indoors. So no supplies, nothing was being delivered. And this was how long after the tsunami had taken place? That was right after the, the nuclear accident that they were given that order. So he actually had to go into YouTube to get help because the mass media wasn't really reporting anything. After that, of course, the government showed up, people got supplies and everything. Um, when I saw the clip on YouTube, though, I was like, I've got to, I just felt that I had to meet him. And in meeting him, what was that like and how did that lead to you wanting to do a documentary? My first sense from the YouTube video that he was very kind of a little bit more going rogue, I guess. But when I got there, it seemed like he kind of slipped back into like the official, you know, follow the government's orders type of thing and wanted people to come back to the town. And that made me want to, of course, know more. And basically, we were accompanied by a journalist from Estonia and we went to Tokyo Electric Power. And when we interviewed Tokyo Electric Power... You actually got through to TEPCO in the weeks after Fukushima? Yeah, um, it was actually in May that we got to the TEPCO corporate office, and we were there for about an hour and 15 minutes, and um, they had their prepped interview, you know, of stuff that they wanted to tell us, and then the journalists let me loose on them, and I asked them all kinds of questions they were not ready for. But the amazing thing was they still answered them. They didn't say no comment or anything, and I captured it all on film. And when I got that on film, I said, this is something that people need to know about. And from that point on, it just led me into making this film. Now, you speak some Japanese, do you not? A little, yes. And when you were asking the questions, were you doing so directly, or did you have to go through interpreters? It depended on who it was. Tapco spoke English, but like the mayor, we had to use interpreter. Yeah, it really depended on where you were. So my movie's kind of mixed in English and Japanese because of that. What are some of the standout moments that you experienced in these, the first few months after Fukushima happened when you're wandering around with, what, a little digital camera? Yeah, I just had a regular consumer camera. What stood out to me was the lady that was denied food and shelter because she was actually from another community, and they told her the shelter was full. So because she didn't register at the shelter, she also couldn't get the government assistance in food. So she was on her own for a good two and a half months. She wasn't even in a shelter. She was in the back of trucks. What really, really got to me was her openness about it and willing to actually get angry about it because it's very uncharacteristic for Japanese people to do that. How open were the Japanese officials that you faced to talking about the nuclear aspect of the disaster they were facing? The officials that we interviewed in Miyagi Prefecture did not want to talk about the radiation at all. They said that it was baseless, harmful rumors, and everything was fine. That's almost a direct quote from them. And what was your knowledge or awareness of this at the time? At the time, I really didn't have a lot of concrete knowledge because I had the Western media saying a lot of things. I had the Japanese media saying nothing. We had the government in TEPCO telling us everything was fine, so really wasn't sure, but I, I knew that there was there was something wrong. And what, if any, protective measures did you take for yourself and your health from the radiation during this time? At the time, we were not really given much instructions on what precautions that we could take, so I didn't really take any. Go in commando in Fukushima. Not a good idea, but Chris, you're still here, and we hope you're here for a good long time. So officials didn't want to speak about the issue. Where did you go for your next sets of information? After I talked to the officials in TEPCO, I went back to talking to the people. Because I wanted to see how the people felt after a few months. And the people basically were pissed. They said basically the same thing. They were not getting, you couldn't trust the information from anybody. And they didn't know what to believe. But they didn't know what to do about it. So a lot of people started to kind of start to speak out about it. How common is this in the Japanese culture? Not common at all. You're not supposed to stand up or speak against anything. They have a saying that um, the nail on the floor is the one that gets hammered down. So you're not supposed to cause a commotion. Don't stick your head up. Right. So here are these people getting pissed off, to use your language, and sticking their heads up. What was it that you were hearing from them? They were very angry with the government and their lack of releasing information to them. And that was the chief complaint from everybody. Where did that lead you in this uh, inadvertent adventure to create a movie? 
I was tandemly volunteering while I was making the film. So I would go back and forth from Tokyo, and I'd spend a couple weeks up there. Then I'd come back maybe for about a week, and then go back. And I was simultaneously interviewing people while doing the volunteer work. So you just kept the camera in your hip pocket, and when somebody had something interesting to say, you whipped it out and took an interview. I asked if they wanted to do it first. I found it took a long time for people to get to their true feeling about something. So sometimes I, the interview would be like an hour, but the good part would always be at the end. So I, I kind of learned quickly that I had to kind of hang on and wait and kind of wade through a lot of things. But what they were really, you know, wanted to say was was usually at the end. So you were interviewing people who you were working with as volunteers. There was already a level of trust there because you were part of the community. You knew a little bit of Japanese. At what point did you stop doing that work and concentrate, perhaps, fully on the documentary as opposed to doing the volunteer work? I was volunteering with a group called Peace Boat in Ishinomaki, and I injured my back and actually my foot also. So I decided that I would focus a little bit more on the movie because I thought that was probably the most important thing that I could do as a volunteer. I started just driving instead, driving supplies. Tell me about your experience at the September 19th six-month rally after this whole disaster began. One day, I heard there was going to be this huge protest, and they said fifty thousand people were going to come and oppose nuclear power in Japan. I kind of was bewildered because I, I couldn't imagine fifty thousand Japanese people getting together to oppose anything just from living there. But I did make a note to go there on September nineteenth, and when I got there, yeah, fifty thousand people turned out, and they said farewell to nuclear power and protect our children. You actually were in Japan for the period of time from the people not really being attuned to having a political response, to the point where the movement that is continuing these days for the shutdown of the Ui reactors, now that they've gone back online, all of that started back when you were there and you were able to follow it through to this milestone demonstration. Yes,、um, I actually captured the smaller demonstrations in the beginning, and you can see actually in the film the demonstrations grow into this full-fledged fifty thousand person protest, which has now become almost like going to be a revolution in Japan. Hopefully, what brought you back to the United States? What made you decide that it was time to come back? I decided it was time to come back when I had a lot of concerns about the food. I mean, we initially, of course, knew that there was going to be problems, but I started to get radiophobia really bad about the food because they were still selling food from Fukushima in the supermarket, and I just said, I can't do this anymore. I need to take production elsewhere. At what point did you come back to the states? I came back early December of 2011. And what has been the journey of the footage that you took to its creation into the film that you've made? I came back to the country with three-month rough cut, and I had to launch a Kickstarter campaign. If you don't know what that is, Kickstarter.com, to raise the money for the post-production for the movie to get it into a 90-minute feature documentary. And how did that go? It was funded five thousand dollars, and actually, even after it ended, we ended up getting an extra thousand dollars and a spot to show the movie in Canada with the Fukushima conference on the anniversary date, March eleventh, two thousand twelve. What was the response like when you showed it at this conference? A lot of people were shocked at what they saw. They, in what way shocked? What were they shocked about? They had no idea that any of that was going on. They. You know, they said, "Well, none of this has been on the news. It's been out of the media. We had no idea that people felt this way. These situations were going on at all." Chris, what was it like when you finally, for the first time, got to show the film in front of an audience? I had an overwhelming response from the Canadian media. I was featured on eight different outlets, including CBC Radio and CBC Television. The screening was packed to capacity. Everybody was shocked to some degree at what they saw.、Uh, they didn't actually know all that was going on there, because the media wasn't really reporting it over here. So, in other words, what you provide in this film, 311 Surviving Japan, is a bridge between 
what was actually happening there in the first six months, starting just a few weeks after the tsunami and earthquake took place, all the way through to this first major demonstration. Information that we, of course, here, unless we were on YouTube and on Facebook, did not know anything about. Since that first screening, what has been happening with the film? After the first screening, it was a rough cut, so we had to raise more money to get it to the final cut. From the Kickstarters, I've had people... Who, that's how we got the first screening. So we had a second screening that just happened in Seattle. That one got another overwhelming response. It was on the local news, too, finally, the story about the movie, and I was really glad that they included the segment about Fukushima because I really wanted to get that back into the mass media, and that's part of the reason I made this movie is because people need to pay attention to what's going on. What are the steps you're taking to launch the film, and what do you hope, what do you envision as the future for this film? My hope is that it helps people first understand the disaster a lot more and that it's a serious, serious event. I mean, this is a potential end-of-the-world event that people are not really taking seriously at all. After that, I want to use any funds from that to help with radiation awareness projects in Japan and even here because a lot of people here aren't really aware that the radiation travels and it traveled across over to the west coast and from there across the west of the country and through rainouts we have no idea where the pockets of the hot spot pockets are around the country if you have a dream of what this film can accomplish where it can go who it can touch what it can achieve in the world what would that look like? We cannot sustain life on this planet if we continue to poison it. At what point do we decide that our health is more important than the economy? You know, we invented the economy, we can change that. Our health and our natural resources, though, we can't replace. And a greater awareness of that really, really, really needs to come about. And I think now is the time, and this incident is one that definitely we could learn that from. And your film is, of course, a major piece in the education of people in a medium that they are familiar with and that makes it easy for them to get the information in a condensed form. If people want to support you in the work that you're doing, where can they go to learn more about you and about the film, and how might they be able to help you? They can go to www.311survivingjapan.com. And those are the numbers 311. Yes. So the number is 311survivingjapan.com. Right now, we are looking to launch the film and get it out there as big as possible. What would help you do that? Distribution and marketing. So if anybody is in the distribution or marketing field and are able to help Chris in any way, even if it's just as an information flow or to network him into others, go to www311 survivingjapancom Chris Nolan, thank you so much for all your efforts on our behalf. Thank you. He got his Kickstarter money, finished the film, and now Christopher Nolan's documentary, 311 Surviving Japan, will premiere on March 11 in North Hollywood, San Diego, San Francisco, and Laguna Niguel in California, Seattle, Washington, New York City, Chicago, Illinois, and Portland, Oregon. In Los Angeles, there will also be a special sneak preview on Saturday, March 9. Tickets for this exclusive showing must be purchased by March 4th, and they may not last that long because they're going so quickly. All information about times, locations, and advanced ticket purchase is available at survivingjapanmovie.com. Make it an event. Get a Klieg light, roll out a red carpet... Hire a limo, invite your friends and family. Don't leave this movie in the echo chamber of those of us who already know and care about the issues it raises. Invite a friend or a neighbor to come with you. Spread the word. Let your local library know. Put it out on your email lists, on Facebook and Twitter. Get your eco-friendly friends to share the word on their lists and then get them to come along with you. If there's no screening available in your area... We will have a link on the Nuclear Hot Seat website where you can learn how to book a screening of your own. Again, it is all searchable on survivingjapanmovie.com. And if anyone asks, is this by the same Christopher Nolan who directed all those Batman films? Just shrug and say, you don't know.
The difference in their names is one letter if you're reading it in print and no difference if you're pronouncing it. So if a little bit of misdirection or confusion gets people motivated to come and see this film, what's wrong with that? The last Batman film actually did have a nuclear theme of sorts, so this would not be an illogical follow-up for that other Christopher Nolan. Whatever we can do that isn't illegal to move this movement forward, I suggest that we do it. A reminder that with the March 11 anniversary of Fukushima coming up, there will be activist actions around the country. In Times Square in New York on Monday, March 11, Hope for the Children of Fukushima will march from Times Square to the United Nations building with speeches, ceremony, and songs. In San Francisco, there's a nuclear whistleblower symposium on Saturday, March 9. Around the country, there will be actions of all kind, both over the weekend and on the actual anniversary on Monday. So Google your location and add nuclear activism to find out more. I will post what I can on nuclearhotseat.com forward slash blog. Here's today's final thought. Tis the season of pro-nukers rolling out their talking points, using their bought and paid for media shills and PR assassins to clog the newspapers and broadcasts with their disinformation. That's because we're getting close to the second anniversary of Fukushima, with its attendant roundup stories in the media. Forbes in particular has been ridiculous and heinous, running virtually back-to-back -back stories about how the radiation from cesium found in bluefish tuna isn't bad for us and might be good for the fish. And then a story on how nuclear industries will one day heat the hot water in our homes. Count me out of that one. What we need to do is find these stories in the media, online, and write comments underneath. If you want to do it in the analog version, make it a letter to the editor. Contradict the stories. Contradict the disinformation. Include links to Dr. Caldecott's upcoming symposium on the medical and ecological consequences of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Or nuclear hot seat. Just so people can go explore and get their own information. We cannot let the pro-nuke blather stand as uncontested truth. Of course, if a reporter gets it right, praise them, and also send praise to their editors, who may have had to put up with a lot of heat from management in order to get these stories on the air or in print. But realize that the media has a short attention span and almost no memory. A one-year anniversary of disaster is always good for a slew of stories. A two-year anniversary, less so. And the opposition to the truth of what we have to put out is by then very well organized and funded. So we've got a battle on our hands for column inches and airtime. After that, the media tends to ignore events until year five, then year 10. And usually after that, it's year 20. So this year, on the second anniversary of Fukushima, we need to take every advantage of the time to get our message out. Remember? The planet and genetic future that you save may be your own. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 26, 2013. Material for this podcast was gathered from ENENews.com, Asia Europe Journal, Washington Post, Beyond Nuclear, Fairwinds Energy Education, and the ever-reliable Arnie Gunderson, Japan Times, World Nuclear News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook Network. Special thanks to Lauren Steiner for her exclusive DC report from the Climate Change Rally. You can find all our podcasts posted on NuclearHotSeat.com. It's still easiest to just click on the blog tab and scroll down. We can also be found if you friend me and Nuclear Hot Seat, two different things, on Facebook. And you can get the entire back library on iTunes Podcasts. We're at 89 right now and counting. Share us, link to us. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so use us as the resource we are. And if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, do not go back to sleep.